Hi, my name is Jordan. I'm a diversity programs manager at Google for the East Coast offices. And um, this is not a diversity related program, but I also am a, a Wharton grad, which is where Richard Schell uh, teaches, or I guess not sure if you're teaching right now, but has done a number of things. So I'm very excited to be here and want to say hi to some of our friends V seeing in from other places. Uh, Richard Schell is a distinguished professor of legal studies, business ethics, and management at the Wharton School of Business at UPenn, which means he took a kind of nasty train ride up here today, so we should thank him for that. Uh, in his time at Wharton, Richard has done a number of really incredible things. Among them is that he founded and continues to direct two executive education negotiations and strategic persuasion workshops. He is the author of three books, one that most of you have in front of you, The Art of Woo. Also, Bargaining for Advantage, which is the book that everybody at Wharton reads in negotiations class. And then also, uh, Negotiation Strategies for Reasonable People, and Make the Rules or Your Rival's Will, rather, is the third book. So he's accomplished a great deal. More than that, he's a very uh, beloved and uh, well-rewarded professor. He is extremely popular at school among students, and then also extremely popular um, in the community of, of people who are also uh, working as scholars in the field and has received a number of awards for his work. He's lectured, held workshops, taught influential leaders in politics, corporations, in the nonprofit world. He's even presented at venues such as the World Economic Forum in Davos. And that's not even to mention some of his work with a number of Fortune 500 companies and uh, leading uh, nonprofits, government agencies. One of my favorites when I was reading through his bio is that that includes working with the FBI's crisis negotiations unit and doing their hostage negotiations training. Uh, his scholarly work has been published widely and internationally in over 12 languages from Japanese to Estonian. So he's uh, well-read, well-renowned, really excited to have him here. And most importantly, I was telling Professor Shell earlier when we were walking around that, uh, or Richard, is what I'm now supposed to call him, uh, <laughs> when we were walking around today that uh, one of my mentors was a, a Wharton graduate as well, and I was, you know, working as a teacher, a nonprofit, and before I went to school, he said, it's very important, you have to just do one thing, make sure you do one thing. I'm like, what is it? And he said, you, know, you have to take negotiations with Richard Shell. It's very important. It was a life-changing class for me. And uh, so I got to Warren, I was really excited. And then, of course, you know, the year that I could take negotiations, he wasn't teaching. So that was a big disappointment. And I was very excited when Evan Wittenberg, who uh, helps run the leading at Google Talks, and this is a part of that series, uh, and, and Rachel Kay invited me to, uh, to help inter and to introduce Professor Shell Richard today. Uh, this will be my chance to take his course. So welcome, Richard Shell. Thank you, Jordan. So I'm on. You can hear me? Great. Uh, and uh, I understand that if I wave to the camera there that I have some folks out in Mountain View and other places that uh, are picking this up. Uh, so I don't know if any other uh, Wharton folks are here, uh, but I want to have a special hi to Gopi Khalil out there in Mountain View, a former student of mine. Helped me a lot with my first book, Bargaining for Advantage. Um, OK, so uh, we have a uh, uh, little time together to talk about uh, some interesting subjects, I hope, things that are uh, part of anyone's success backpack. Uh, in today's world, I think, uh, the skills you need are the skills that you can put in your backpack. Uh, the ones you can take with you wherever you go uh, as a career goes through many changes, even within one organization or between various organizations. And uh, negotiation, persuasion, and influence are certainly uh, right up near the top of those subjects that are going to make you effective professionally. So that's what we're going to look at. Um, I have a questionnaire that I've uh, distributed, and very important that uh, you do that. It takes about four minutes, uh, but later on uh, in a bit, we're going to talk about your results on that. And I think you'll find it quite interesting if you've done it. So it's very simple. Uh, I'll be talking sort of, you can make me noise in the background for a few minutes while you do that. It's much more important that you do that than you, that you hear anything I'm going to say in the next three or four minutes. Uh, but it's very simple. You just, they're, they're little pairs of statements. I am asking you to pick the one that's more true for you, not the one that you ought to use or the one you used yesterday or the one you wished you'd use yesterday, 
but the one that just is more often more true for you in general. And then note the letter in the right-hand column of whichever statement that is. And then just keep running through this uh, uh, for the two pages that are there. There's a series of pairs. And then at the very end, you have to add up how many different letters you accumulated from A to B to C to D to E. And then stop, and I will uh, be able to uh, tell you where we're going to go with that after you've done the addition. So that's uh, job one for you uh, as participants here. I believe that whenever a Wharton professor goes anywhere, homework <laughs> is definitely uh, part of the deal. So this is your homework. So while you, uh, some of you are finished with that, some of you are still doing it, do that, I will uh, mumble back here uh, by way of introductions. This is the question that the Art of Wu uh, was inspired by. Why? do good ideas in good organizations die? Even at Google, which is phenomenally uh, well known for innovation and for flat organizational structures and for uh, uh, coming up with an idea a minute, uh, not all the good ideas end up being implemented. Some of them uh, get up near implementation and then fall back. Some never quite get launched uh, and then a few uh, uh, do, but what's the natural selection process that leads to the ideas that get implemented and leads to the many other ones that don't? Uh, and among those that don't are some very good ideas. And I have a thesis on why good ideas die, uh, uh, assuming that they're all equally good, and that is that people who are good at coming up with ideas aren't always very good at influencing other people that there is not a perfect overlap between those two skills, innovation on the one hand and persuasion on the other. So uh, the book and my teaching uh, has a lot uh, to do with trying to figure out how to take people at whatever level of skill they are in this area and then make them more effective. And the thesis that we start with is not that there is uh, 16 uh, moves like uh, you can pick off a Chinese restaurant menu, uh, and if you see situation X, do Y, and if you're in X and you do Y and they do Z, then do B. Uh, it doesn't work like that. Uh, and negotiation, influence, persuasion are intimately connected with who you are as a person. They're not tactics. They are uh, expressions, emotions, instincts, and your connection with other people. So the thesis of both Bargaining for Advantage and The Art of Wu is that we start from the inside, who we are, and we work out to others so that when we do try to persuade them, we do so with credibility. As opposed to the other approach, the one more common in the airport books on negotiation and persuasion, which is we start from the outside with your, your favorite list of tactics, whatever they are, cooperative, competitive, uh, uh, manipulative, uh, or not, rather than starting from the outside with all these sort of manipulations and then say, you, you, you know, kind of twist your personality into the shape that it would take to make this uh, tactic work, and then we send you forth, where, of course, if you're at any level of, of uh, professional uh, interactions at all, you will end up losing uh, your credibility as well as uh, whatever the attempt to persuade others was. Um, big circle, three different colors. Uh, the biggest circle, this is to kind of give us a landscape of what we're talking about here, is interpersonal influence. All the things you do, conscious and unconscious, intentional and unintentional, that prompt other people to do that which you wish they would do. Uh, when I was a kid, I was raised in the United States Marine Corps. My dad was a general in the Marines, and uh, not all the time. I guess he was a colonel when I was born, but he became a general when I was pretty young. So he was a commanding general in a couple of places where I was living. And I remember one night, uh, I was uh, about seven years old, and I was sitting at dinner. And uh, as we were going through the dessert, I have two sisters and my mom, as getting to dessert, he reached over and said, Richard, shake hands. And he stuck his hand out, and I just gave him one of these, you know, 
noodle handshakes. And he went, no, 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 no. And I said, well, you know. So he said, you, you've got to put the hand out there, look me in the eye, make it firm but not too firm, and then that's what I want you to do. So I practiced a little bit. <laughs> And, uh, and, you know, after a little while, he was satisfied with that. And so that was that. Uh, the next day, uh, my dad came home from work, and I was sitting in the living room uh, after school. And when my dad came home from work, it looked a little different than when most dads came home from work. Because when he came home from work, uh, this car pulled up in front with flags on the front of it. And this guy jumped out of the front seat and snapped to attention, opened the door, and then he got out. Uh, so after that little performance, he comes into the living room, and he walks right over to me without even pausing and says, Richard, shake hands. And I was, ah, you know, what, 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 what's happening? Another noodle came out. Uh, and, 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 and we went through the whole lesson again. Uh, so for the next three or four days, my dad uh, would jump on me at odd moments and stick his hand out, and I had to shake hands with him. And by the third day, uh, the fourth day, I was ready for him, no matter where he was. I was on the alert for a handshake. And, uh, and so, you know, what was he doing? What was my dad doing for me? What was he teaching me? What, what do you do almost every time you see somebody you don't know well? You shake hands. What do you do at the beginning of every negotiation that you're going to have? You shake hands. What do you do at the end of every negotiation if it's successful? If it's unsuccessful, you throw something. But, you know, uh, but... Uh, how important is it professionally to have a decent handshake? Absolutely. Isn't that amazing? Now, of course, in some cultures, to shake hands is a huge mistake. And you would create a huge bad impression if you stuck your hand out in an Islamic culture uh, and were trying to shake hands with a woman, for example. It would absolutely be the end of any relationship. But in our culture and in the Western civilizational global business environment. Shaking hands is pretty important. It doesn't actually convince anybody of anything, but it removes a potential barrier to them hearing what you're going to say next. Because if you're recruiting somebody to work at Google, and they come on with a really bad handshake in the first round, they may be the most brilliant computer scientist that ever Stanford produced. And you'll forgive them a lot for that. But your mind will unconsciously be processing, but what about the handshake? What are we going to do about that handshake? Can we, put the, can we afford to have this guy show up with customers with that handshake? How are we going to bring this up to him? You know, you know you're, you're a really brilliant guy, but you mind if we send you to handshake school for a couple of days? Uh, yeah, it's awkward. And so uh, like many influence tools, shaking hands, unconscious, but incredibly important uh, as a basic self-presentation, impression management part of your communication toolkit. And there's a lot of stuff like that. And that's what's going on in the big yellow circle. Inside that, as a subset of influence tools, is persuasion. Now, persuasion is when you make a case for something based on some form of argument. It could be an argument based on data. It could be an argument based on logic. It could be an argument based on authority. It could be an argument based on relationships. It could be an argument based on interests. And depending on the culture you're in, certain arguments have more traction. So in Google, I, from what I've heard, if you go in and say, uh, this is a good idea, um, uh, uh, the people in authority think so, that's not exactly one of the favored arguments. And so even if the people in authority do think so, it probably isn't the first thing you want to say in defense of or promoting some idea uh, because it's not, it's not uh, approved as a cultural kind of variable. Uh, but something related to data, something related to logic, something related to you know, making good sense and being elegant, that would be probably a, a pretty good starter for that. So these are making a case. And I'm going to actually be giving a workshop here uh, two weeks from today, and we're going to deep, you know, for a day, we're going to dig into uh, a bit uh, uh, more depth some of these influence tools and how you can actually get better at them uh, in a more workshop setting. Uh, inside persuasion, in the blue circle in the middle, is a special form of persuasion, negotiation. 
Now, when you're negotiating, you're persuading people. But it's a special situational variable, and that situational variable is this. At least one of the two people sitting there thinks that there's a conflict between their interests and yours. And if they think that there's a conflict between your interests, then there is uh, a different process, a little more complicated process, actually a little more structured process that is going to probably ensue. Now, I, I say only one party has to think about that there's this conflict because if one party thinks that there's a conflict of interest and the other party picks that up, which is pretty clear most of the time, um, that means person A, who has this perception, is behaving somewhat strategically, carefully, prudently, and person B, their little antenna goes up and goes, hmm, not the usual open kind of communication uh, thing here, what's going on? And so they naturally take a step back and they begin jockeying a little. So when are you gonna get to the part where you tell me what it is you want? And now they're negotiating whether there's actually a conflict of interest or not. So one of the things that actually uh, makes a, a great negotiator great is their ability to see that there isn't a conflict of interest when the other party is acting as if there was one and raise the discussion level above that perception so that you can get back to persuading and influencing each other and talking about whatever it is that you all want to do. Uh, now, this is tricky because if you do that, if you try to uh, disclose enough information so that the other party is relaxed about it, you take a risk that if you're wrong, they gain an advantage from your having disclosed all that information. So, uh, so the, the, the difficult Occam's razor place that a great negotiator is able to occupy is great at protecting their interests and great at minimizing the conflict. Those two things together are hard to do uh, at the same time. But it's a special situation in the middle there. So all the things that we're talking about here today are all three of these things. Because when you are interacting with others, you never know exactly where you're going to end up among these circles. I was, uh, uh, I was long, not a few years ago, I was uh, living near the University of Pennsylvania in uh, University City. And I was sitting in my kitchen with my wife and two sons. And the phone rang. And it was a neighbor's daughter. Her name was Emily. And this was when uh, uh, my older son was about 10 and my younger son was about 5. And Emily was 10, uh, same age as my son. And, uh, and I happened to be sitting near the phone, so I picked it up. Uh, and uh, Emily said, Richard because we talked to each other in first names on our street. Uh, she was the daughter of the dean of the School of Arts and Sciences graduate programs at the university. Um, uh, this is Emily. And I said, oh, oh, hi, Emily, what's up? She said, well, we're raising money for our high school softball or middle school softball team in order to take a trip so we can practice and win our little league championship this year. We wonder if you'll help out. Now, let's stop the movie. Is there any doubt that I'm going to help out? She's the daughter yeah. of the dean of the School of Arts and Sciences, dean of graduate schools, who lives three doors away. And she and my son go to the same school. No, there is no doubt. And I was cursing the moment I picked up the phone. <laughs> um, well, OK, Emily, so what are you doing? Well, we're selling fruit, she said. Uh, and I said, well, tell me more. Uh, and so she said, well, we have uh, these packages of Florida fruits. There's the $30 package, and that has, and then she went and recited this 25 grapefruits and two, you know, dozen oranges and a bunch of, you know, lemons and stuff. And I went to myself, this is never going to fit in the fridge, uh, you know. Uh, I said, well, there are there any other options? And she said, mm, there's a $20 option. And I said, what's that? And she said, well, that's, you know, 12 grapefruits and, you know, 12 oranges and six lemons and a guava and a banana, you know, whatever it was. And I said, mm, well... I still think we have a refrigerator problem, Emily. Is there another option? And she said, well, there is the $11 package. <laughs> and I said, well, what's that? And she said, and she named that. And I thought, I can fit this in the fridge. I said, we'll take the $11 package. Now, just at that moment, where were we in the persuasion influence uh, area? Uh, she's 
been very civil to me. Uh, she's using her relationships to leverage. Uh, I'm sure her mom had given her a list of numbers to call. She said, call these numbers. Uh, you'll be hit your quota in 20 minutes. Uh, and uh, she was being sweet and supplicant. And so I was uh, you know, just doing whatever I could to get off the phone. Uh, but just at that moment, it all changed. Uh, my wife piped up and said, is that Emily? And she said, I said, yes. And she said, ask her about the guinea pig. I said, what? And my older son said, Ned's new guinea pig. Now, Ned, we'd just gotten a guinea pig for Ned for a pet. And we were going away for the weekend uh, to a trip in New York City to go to some plays. And we needed someone to sit for the guinea pig. And I went, oh, I forgot. Oh, Emily, listen, uh, are you guys going to be around this weekend? And she said, yeah. And I said, well, would you mind taking care of Ned's new guinea pig? We're going to be away for the weekend. It'd be great if you could you know, drop in and feed a few carrots and stuff. And she said, oh, we'd love to. But in that case, will you take the $20 package? <laughs> Before I knew it, I was in the middle. I'd gone from peaceful persuasion and influence. And then I made a huge mistake. I had introduced a new issue before we closed. <laughs> and whammo, she was smart. She was awake. She was negotiating. She had a goal. Uh, and so I ended up paying $9 more for a guinea pig sitter than I would have otherwise had to pay if I'd been smart enough to keep out of the middle circle. Now, that would have been a test of my true skill as a great negotiator. Um, how could I have kept out of that middle circle? Very simple, actually, set of moves that you can do to extract yourself from that middle circle. When someone tries to, you know, when, it, when, 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 when the situation gets a little complicated in the middle and, it, you, you know, you're, you're being careless, you know, you've got to be aware. So awareness is first. Don't introduce a new issue before you close on something someone's asking a favor from for you because pretty soon you link them and now, now it's a negotiation. Um, what could I have done? What could I have done? Pass the phone. Very nice. To who? I don't have a daughter. I've got an older son and a younger son. Who's the best negotiator on this subject in our house? The younger son. Yes. Why? As between me and Emily, who has to be nice? I'm the older. I'm the adult. I'm the compassionate one. I have to honor the, the, the fact that she's helpless. As between Ned and Emily, though, who's the more helpless one? Emily. No, Ned. He's only five. So now, can you imagine? Here, there's two things that we've done there. First, we broke the two transactions. I said, Emily, excuse me for a second. Ned has something he wants to ask you. OK. So we broke the two transactions. And then secondly, we changed the status of the parties involved so that the one uh, who's asking is the more helpless one. And if you're in a relationship, helplessness is good. <laughs> if you're not, it's not so good. But in a relationship, helplessness is strength. Uh, can be credibly asserted. So then Ned could get on the phone and say, oh, Emily, could you help? We have a guinea pig problem. And, and, and she would have to say, sure. And if she said, then put your dad back on. I want another $9 for the guinea pig. She would look like a, you know, a jerk. So, uh, so that would have put uh, the whole game back in place. But I was not alert enough or smart enough to pull that off. So, and that happens. Doesn't that happen all the time? You, be, you know, you're walking down the hall. Someone goes by on their little scooter and says, oh, by the way, uh, you know, you mind if you stay Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday, Friday, and do something I was supposed to do because I have to go leave? And, and you go, uh, uh, uh. And, and before you know it, uh, you know, you've got these things in mind. And maybe that's when you want to negotiate. You say, well, you know, I could if. And now we have a discussion where everybody gets a little something in exchange for a little something else. Uh, and there's nothing wrong with that. As opposed to just saying yes and finding yourself with everybody else's work while they're off you know, being innovative or whatever it is that they're doing. Uh, and you're busy you know, minding the store. So, so sometimes you want to negotiate. But it's very nice if you're able to manage this interface and realize the difference between influence, persuasion, and negotiation and choose which of those is the best place for you to be to get your goals achieved. Uh, strategic choice. Uh, and that's why the book is called The uh, uh, Selling Ideas with per Strategic Persuasion. You have to think. 
Uh, OK. So I wanted to tell you a quick high-tech tale uh, uh, of why it is that good ideas fail. Uh, and then uh, we look a little bit at Google. I've actually gone and made some phone calls, talked to some Googlers, and heard some of the stories uh, about how things actually work here. And I'm not uh, by any means an expert on that, but I do have some impressions that I could share with you. Uh, and then we'll look at, uh, uh, at the questionnaires that you guys have just done uh, while I was yakking about Emily. Uh, so uh, hopefully you're all done with that now. So this is told in the book. In the 1920s, there was a great high-tech, cutting-edge company called General Motors. And they were out there on the cutting edge of design, making cars that weren't all black, which was the way the Ford company was doing this, uh, with all kinds of innovative engineering. And a guy named Charles Kettering uh, was uh, the chief engineer and innovator at General Motors. He had been hired uh, from a company he started called Delco. And uh, he was the laboratory guy. He was, and he, he, we still are using a bunch of his innovations. He invented uh, automatic transmission. He invented safety glass. He invented uh, you know, all kinds of things that are still part of an automobile. His, he was on the cover of Time magazine in 1932. Uh, and most people put him in the same class as uh, Edison. People don't think of him as much anymore as they do of Edison because he wasn't such a good publicist. Uh, uh, but uh, here in New York, you do have a legacy, the Sloan Kettering uh, Foundation. And he worked for a guy named Alfred Sloan, who was the head of General Motors. And that's why they started that uh, Cancer Institute together. Um, so Kettering came up with a really good idea right after he got to General Motors. And the really good idea was an air-cooled engine. All the engines were water-cooled in those days. Kettering came up with this really you know, box-breaking idea of an air-cooled engine. And he went to the board of uh, General Motors and Alfred Sloan first, and he sold this idea. And Sloan said, that's why we hired you. Air-cooled engine sounds good to us. You know, go for it. Uh, board said, sure, here's some money. Uh, go pursue it. And so he went back to the lab and started uh, you know, expanding on this idea of the air-cooled engine. We, we now have air-cooled engines. Anybody here an automotive uh, buff? Uh, the air-cooled engine is a uh, first mass-produced car was the uh, Volkswagen Beetle. Yeah. Uh, but subsequently, a number of other air-cooled engines in some pretty high-performance vehicles have uh, been successful. So this was not some pie-in-the-sky idea. It was just way before its time. Um, and Kettering made his big mistake. He got his money and he got his authority, and then he went back to the lab. And uh, in the wisdom of General Motors, they assigned the rollout of this product and the testing of it to the Chevrolet division. And the Chevrolet division was their most successful division, and it was run by a guy named Zimmerscheid. Uh, and when Zimmerscheid heard that his division was going to be stuck with this wacko idea of the air-cooled engine, uh, uh, he made it known in his internal councils that this wasn't really his priority. And so consequently, uh, uh, the attempt to get the Chevrolet people to play ball, to create the prototypes and to do all the work that was needed, right, res you know, met passive resistance. Now, anybody here at Google ever experienced passive resistance? Hands up if you've experienced passive resistance. Yeah, this is an age-old tool of people who don't want to do something, but it's incorrect to say no. Uh, passive resistance takes the form of not showing up for meetings because things happen that make it impossible to come, of delays on the schedule, whatever the schedule is, of confusion and excuses where other things might happen. And so you get this sort of systematic non-action, and that's what the Chevrolet division did. And, and because it wasn't making any progress, what happens to an idea in an organization when it doesn't get any immediate early successes? What happens every time there's a problem? What do people think? I told you so. And so it becomes a self-confirming prophecy that it won't happen. Because without that early momentum, everybody's sort of shooting at it. And uh, the same thing which could look like a bump in the road if everybody was looking up looks like a gigantic pit if everybody's looking down. And that's what happened to the Kettering air-cooled engine. It died. He finally went to the board and said, you, you authorize this. Use your authority. Tell Chevrolet to do this. And GM in those days was like Google now. 
They couldn't use authority. It wasn't the culture. And so they basically had to say, look, it's just not going to work. So we're just going to pull the funding. You can work on it on your own. And, uh, and, uh, and we're off to the races with other things. So a good idea died because the guy who was managing it didn't do the political work and the buy-in and the, the persuasion and the influence needed to make a perfectly good idea work. Um, and that's really the problem. So here at Google, what's it look like? It's not like General Motors now, but it's not that different from General Motors then. Uh, a pretty non-hierarchical organization, highly innovative, cutting edge in its field. Automobiles in those days were only 15 years old. Uh, and internet search is only 20. Uh, and, uh, and, and you don't have much to say about authority. Everybody's sort of you know, on the same level. Uh, and that gives you a pretty tough idea selling environment in one sense. You know, you've got a lot of ideas, got a lot of bright people. That means you've got a lot of ideas. You've got a little bit of time because it's light speed, fast is better than slow. Uh, so getting people's mind share when everybody's racing is pretty hard to do. Uh, you've got uh, lots of missions. You're going to save the world. You've got to have internet search best practices. You've got to have a phone. You've got to have you know, lots of different things are cooking all in the same time in the same stove. So that makes priorities hard to figure out. Uh, there are uh, n n really very few areas of authority, per se, that you can go to and appeal and say, use your authority. You, know, you said this was going to be a priority. Uh, you have to use other tools. And that means idea selling becomes a critical competency. Absolutely critical. It isn't like the Marine Corps, where the chairman of the Joint Chiefs of Staff says, go left, and everybody goes, you know, right on. Let's go left. Uh, uh, you know, I was talking to Jordan just before the talk here, and I was asking her, uh, so you know, she does diversity and human resources, a really important priority at Google. Uh, suppose she needs engineering assistance for the special little thing that she has to have done. Uh, that's kind of complicated and a little off to the side and not exactly like, you know, the biggest priority for the, uh, uh, you know, the Google ad program. Uh, how's she going to do that? And at first we had a little trouble communicating just what the question was. Uh, but I finally got through and she said, oh, well, uh, you have to take a lot of people to lunch. <laughs> <You know? laughs> Basically, you have to really get to know people. You have to have a network. And that's uh, probably what it takes. But what happens to that need for a network when your organization is going to double in size in the next five years and uh, be all over the world with offices here, there, and everywhere, and you never see the people? You can't have lunch with them because they're in Asia or, or they're in South America, and you still need their help for something. You know, that's, the, that's the paradox. That's the challenge that you're going to face. Uh, if you were just going to stay the same size and everything was just going to be like freeze, then it would you know, everything would be fine, but you're not. You're going to grow, and you're going to grow fast. And that's going to mean that these persuasion skills and these influence skills are going to become absolutely career critical to people if they want to get their ideas through. Now, if you don't want to get your ideas through, then you can just, you know, do your job and, you know, and let everybody else have initiatives and just you know, be helpful. But if you do want to get your ideas through, you're going to have to know how to do this. So here are the three things you need to know. You need to know what the process is, that gets things done. And as invisible as it might look, there's a process. And you have to figure it out. There's a process that might be different depending on what part of Google you're in. And then you have to have self-awareness. What kind of personality are you bringing to this party? And, um, and that means you get to know your biases. You think ideas sell themselves. Other people don't think so. If they, if they think so, too, then great. You can sit down and you, you know, pick out the best idea. That's it. But if they don't think so, if they've got other priorities, like whether it's supposed to make money or whether it's supposed to look beautiful or whether it's supposed to you know, accomplish uh, a certain goal with respect to some office priority, uh, then you've got other things that you have to persuade on. And finally, you have to have this perspective-taking ability, an ability to get out of yourself and see the world from the other guy's point of view so that you can make that sale. Uh, now these are ancient ideas. Uh, know yourself was, you know, the Delphic Oracle was working on that one. And know your audience is the basis of Aristotle's rhetoric. So we're not talking about anything new here. But for some reason, human beings, 
because of their setup, have a hard time getting these two things right. And every generation, they have to learn it over and over and over. And some people get better at it than others. Um, so these are the three things. And I just want to kind of tool through the first. We're going to deal with this in a lot more uh, depth in the workshop. But uh, five keys to success in terms of the process. First, relationships and networks, which I've already talked about. Uh, Lou Wasserman, uh, Universal Studios, I don't consider I have power, I have relationships. And one of the Google executives I spoke with prior to coming here, relationships versus data, relationships. Uh, so although it's a database culture, relationships are actually what you have to have in order for anything to get done. Uh, and so first relationships, then data. Uh, if all you have is data, no relationships, you're going to have a serious problem. Um, credibility, second uh, big tool. And credibility is based on these various factors. Uh, what do other people think you know? Credibility is an endowment others give you. It is not something you keep in your pocket and come out and say, by the way, here's my credibility. You, know. uh, you have to have it because other people give it to you. It's a gift. That means they have to know what you have done, what your expertise is, uh, and they have to trust you. And in this culture, I think it's, it's pretty clear to me that the best interest of Google is the way to gain credibility as opposed to how to build an empire or how to get your own self promoted or all that kind of stuff. So uh, they have to trust you. And of course, you can get credi credibility by affiliation. If they don't know you and they don't know what you know and they don't know who you are, but you can find an ally who they do know and they do trust and they do have, that's almost as good as having it yourself. And so that's the alliance building process. That's the finding the champions, finding the allies. That is the critical when you are working through these networks to get ideas heard. Credibility, the second tool. Third, communication. So I noticed as I walked around here, you've got sales. They have these bright lights over there with you know, uh, windows over there. And then you've got engineering. And they're over there with all the scooters and you know, sort of a little darker. And, uh, <laughs> and they're in the middle of the place. Uh, and do those two people speak the same language? No, one's Greek and the other's you know, Estonian, right? I mean, it's, it's, uh, it might as well be uh, two functions as different as engineering and sales can speak radically different languages. And so depending on who's trying to get what done, you have to speak their language. So engineers have to learn how to speak sales. Sales have to learn how to speak engineering uh, uh, and uh, so on. And it takes a little effort, and it takes more of those relationships again. And you, know, you can get counsel. Friend who's an engineer, you're trying to persuade engineer A. Engineer A is going into passive resistance mode. Uh, and so you can go over to friend engineer and say, listen, uh, here's how I pitch this. Maybe you could help me figure out how to get their attention and, uh, and get a little extra perspective on what language, what order of argument, what values is going to feature and frame your idea more appealingly than what you just did. Uh, and so, you know, very helpful if you can learn to speak more than one language in an organization, especially this one. Beliefs, I love this quote. Another person I interviewed uh, told me this uh, from Google. Uh, I'll agree with your data if your data agrees with me. <laughs> and so I know, I work at the Wharton School, that just because you have a lot of data uh, doesn't mean you're going to be persuasive. Because if the people don't believe what it is that you're trying to say, they will find a way to poke holes in the data. There is no database argument that can't be riveted by machine gun fire that on methodology, on significance, on variables, uh, et cetera. So, but if the audience wants to buy what you want to sell, then they'll overlook a lot of the holes in your data because they'll be filling in the gaps themselves, saying plausible, 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 plausible. And, uh, and you can make a sale. So really important that you uh, sort of understand whether you're running up against a belief barrier. That is the tough one. If you run up against a belief barrier, you've got a huge problem. Think for yourselves. When was the last time you changed a core belief because of something someone else tried to persuade you of? It's not easy to come up with those examples. And that's what it's like when you're trying to hammer on somebody and you run up against a hostile belief. So when you have a hostile belief, that's when you have to go around, under, through, uh, reframe, 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 uh, and not try to take on the belief head on. It's very difficult to do. Uh, and then finally, of course, you know, in Google, you've got a bunch of standard beliefs. 
Uh, consistency will help you if you can leverage those. You want to be in a hurry. Fast is better than slow, so that's a nice thing to be able to say to somebody. Uh, and if your, uh, if your program really shoots for the moon in terms of some e excellence metric, and they are saying, well, let's just do something half-assed, uh, you know, you can come back with, you know, great's just not good enough and try to, you know, leverage their beliefs in the standards that the company has. Now, you know, they have to believe them. And that's where organizational intelligence comes in. Because companies all have beliefs that they state, but not everybody believes them. I was doing a program for an oil company not too long ago, and at the very end, the guy who was managing the program came over to me, the person from, uh, from training, and said, don't forget to, to, to mention the mission. This, you know, the mission statement. And I had, you know, there were like six mission things that everything was supposed to revolve around in the program, and I hadn't mentioned them. Uh, and I said, oh, the mission things, okay. Uh, and so, I, you know, I went, and, and, and as my closing, I said, and by the way, all the negotiation principles we today line up really elegantly with your mission statements here. One, two, I got to the third one, and the whole group of crusty oil engineers, and they were laughing. <laughs> and they were laughing so hard. They said, don't tell us about the mission statements again. You know, you know, that's just a crock. You know? uh, <laughs> and I went, oh, oh okay. You know? <laughs> well, you know, see you later. <laughs> and then I went. So if they don't believe it, then it's useless, right? You have to know what they believe if you want to get traction out of things. OK. Uh, and of course, negotiating interests. Uh, Things like control, resources, time, money, everything there's something scarce of, not enough promotions, not enough uh, career uh, achievement, that's when you're probably in the negotiation realm. And you better bring out your trading ability to make it work. Um, so uh, that's some, uh, some sort of touchstones on process. Now, people uh, and self-awareness is where we start. So I wanted to talk just for a minute about this questionnaire you had. Uh, because a little self-awareness here, this is how you, uh, uh, this questionnaire is designed to try to get at your preferences and intuitions about managing interpersonal conflict, the blue, the blue zone inside the middle. Uh, and if you'll get your sheet out and you added up the numbers, take the very last sheet, which is a grid, and put your numbers uh, on the grid, circle the numbers in the following way. Your A score should be the number you find under the column for competing. And so you circle the number under competing, uh, find the number that your A score was, and circle that uh, under competing. And then your B score is collaborating, the, the second column uh, from the left. You circle that number. Your C score is compromising. That's the one in the middle. And you find your score for C and circle that under the third column. Your D score is avoiding. And that's the uh, fourth one over there. And you circle that one uh, under avoiding, uh, under the, the, the uh, avoiding category. And, and then finally, obviously, E is for accommodating. Uh, and you circle that one. And once you've gotten five circles, I found it helpful if you connect them with four lines and you get a little elegant, nice graph. Uh, some have rising stock prices, some falling stock prices, you know, Ws, Vs, Ms, whatever. And uh, I just want to talk briefly about this as a kind of tool that we're going to you know, use in the workshop to try to help you gain some self-insight into what you're bringing to this party. Because how you manage interpersonal conflict uh, has a lot to do with uh, a lot of these sort of preparatory strategies you're going to use. Because if you're highly allergic to interpersonal conflict, if it makes you uneasy and anxious, then you will do a lot not to get to the purple area. And if you're fearless when it comes to interpersonal conflict, then you'll go driving through straight with the scooter right through the interpersonal conflict, and you'll be behaving quite differently than someone who is really nervous about it. Uh, so let's just take, uh, let's see if I have this here. Yeah, let's just take a, a quick tour through this. Uh, as, our, uh, as our final uh, item. We got one more item after this, but it's very short. Uh, so accommodation, that's the E score. Uh, how many of you scored a seven or higher in accommodation? That's near the top of the uh, chart there. Okay, a bunch of you. And anybody scored down near the bottom? One, zero, one, two, three? Okay, that's fine. Uh, then actually, in engineering uh, cultures, I found there are many people who score uh, down near the bottom in accommodation. It's a uh, sort of a, a bias toward there being a right answer and that analysis can find it. And so we don't really need to accommodate when we know what the right answer is. Uh, so it's a, it's a slightly different uh, point of view. Uh, if you're highly accommodating, you think about people first. How can I be helpful? Are they in a bad mood? You know, what, you know, can, I, can I do anything to make them feel better? If you're weakly accommodating, you tend to think about ideas and outcomes and solutions 
And the people part's like a noise in the background. You know, uh, wake me up when the cocktail party's over and we can talk about whatever the meeting's about. That's, that's the weekly accommodating approach. Highly accommodating is let's go to the cocktail party early so we can meet as many people as possible and get a feeling for this organization. Uh, among people I've taught over the years, highly accommodating uh, groups, uh, relationship-based selling organizations, the people who do relationship selling, uh, nurse executives in the American healthcare system, uh, weekly accommodating uh, uh, people in, in several engineering groups that I've taught uh, where, you know, within a company, a pretty high percentage of them were pretty, you know, straight up uh, in that regard and it's kind of solution oriented. And it's interesting, if you're weekly accommodating and you're dealing with someone who's weekly accommodating, you will get along like peaches and cream because both people will know, uh, let's get to the data, let's get to the solution, let's argue the merits, and, and I don't care whether you're having a bad day or a good day, let's deal with the problem. Uh, and two highly accommodating people will also get along like peaches and cream because they'll be concerned about each other and maybe this is not a good time and, you know, uh, you know, well, you know I'll pay for lunch. And, you know. uh, and, uh, and it's the problem is when the two meet and they don't understand each other. So the highly accommodating person is feeling like they don't care about me. They, you know, they didn't ask about the fact that I'm coughing and, you know, in a terrible mood. And the weekly accommodating person is saying, why don't they just talk about the problem? <laughs> um, okay, avoidance. Uh, how many people scored seven or higher in avoiding? All right, this is the real, you know, tummy problem with conflict uh, one. Uh, if you're highly avoiding, it's, it's really, uh, you know, conflict is really something that makes you nervous. You want to avoid it. Uh, people who have high avoiding scores are often really interested in having rules so we don't have to have these awkward discussions uh, or some form of hierarchy or some understanding about taking turns that you know, makes it so we don't have to negotiate. Take the ambiguity out of it so we know where we stand. Weakly avoiding people are much more uh, direct, blunt, uh, a little bit incorrect politically uh, and just you know, bull, bull their way through it. Uh, again, uh, avoiding uh, people that we've taught, UN diplomats, a lot of avoiders in the UN. Uh, and, well, it makes sense. Think about it. I mean, what is it, you know, what, when was the last peace accord stable? Uh, uh, highly avoiding people often get peace for a day. But if you're in the UN and war is the alternative, that's a pretty good solution if, if the uh, peace is hard to get. Uh, weekly avoiding people I've taught, uh, Teamsters, United Food and Commercial Workers, uh, you know, uh, uh, and, uh, and that, uh, you know, more blunt cultures, you know, Microsoft culture actually early, uh, very, very weakly avoiding. Bill Gates' personality was sort of stamped on that, uh, shout, he's a shouter, and he hired shouters, and so they all shouted at each other, you know. Uh, I think by now they've gotten over it because, you know, it's a big company and they've gone through some evolution, but early in the company's history, there were a lot of very blunt people there. Uh, interesting what's happened today, isn't it? Uh, I wonder if Yahoo people are shouters. <laughs> we'll find out. Uh, compromise. High, highly inclined to compromise? Uh, okay, this is a very reasonable trait when the stakes are small, when time is short, splitting the difference, taking turns, doing you know, some standard, very, very useful trait to have. Uh, on the other hand, uh, weakly inclined to compromise, down near the bottom on this one. All right, just a few of you. A little more issues of principle matter more, uh, and it's not just compromise. It's, it's, it's really let's have uh, a, a standard that we can live with that's a precedent that, that is valid. And so tend to be a little bit more interested in hooking into the principles of matter. Um, uh, collaborator, high in the, the collaboration category. Interesting. Okay, down near the bottom on that. Okay, now this also can be a, a factor in inside organizations. If you have a highly collaborative person, they tend to like uh, to have meetings with lots of people and get all the facts and circumstances and really work the problem and make it sort of elegant and, and really you know, get all the interest out. If you have weekly collaborating people, they like to have agendas and sort of take them one at a time and keep it orderly and, and sort of make, you know, make sure that the meeting gets run on time and stuff like that. So you can have a little collision of, of, of uh, Kind of preferences at the extreme here uh, doesn't mean everybody can be creative. So this is not a creative thing. This is just how you manage the people part uh, of that. Uh, and finally, competition. Anybody highly competitive in this? Yeah? Okay, a bunch. And uh, weekly competitive. Okay, a little more. Okay. Well, this is you know at the Wharton School, everybody would have raised their hand for competition. I mean, almost. Uh, you know, it's it's a it's in the conflict situation. If there's a chance to win or lose, highly competitive people, if it's appropriate. You know, if it's if it's uh, if it's if 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 there's a transactional element, 
really enjoy winning. I mean, you know, someone's got to win. Uh, uh, so they like to get up on the day to hop by the car. You know, they, 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 you know they're going to get the last $500 off that car. And that's where it gets interesting for them. If you're weakly competitive on the interpersonal conflict side, this is not competitive like you like to beat you know, Yahoo. This is like competitive on an interpersonal basis. Uh, weakly competitive people really don't like going to buy the car. Uh, they kind of think the last $500 of a $50,000 car is sort of like not worth fighting over. Uh, and so they kind of lose heart at, at that point and want a relationship with a the salesperson. They want to have a nice time at the dealership and be treated well and, and feel good about the whole experience. And getting the last $500 risks that, and so they, they're disinclined to do it. So these are just some uh, little, little footnotes, uh, the, you know, hypotheses, if you will. Uh, the scores really are, it's garbage in, garbage out. So you know, depending on how you fill out this thing, you get a better or worse sort of um, footprint of what it is that's going on when you're in the blue circle, in the middle, uh, and whether or not that's a, point, a place that you relish uh, or it's a place that you try to stay away from uh, is an interesting and good thing to know about organizational life because if you are avoiding conflicts a lot, that's going to definitely define the kinds of meetings you like to go to, the, the patience and the amount you can listen when the, when the winds are blowing and the, and the, and the, the conflicts uh, you know, really hot, uh, and a lot of other things. Whereas if you are a very conflict sort of uh, neutral, then you may be blowing other people away. You know, they may be thinking that you're really blunt and rude and, and because you keep going back to subjects that they thought were settled and, and you make it, you know, you, you come at them a little hard. And that's something you want to know as well. It's not that you are blunt, it's just that they think so. <laughs> because they like to avoid conflict. <laughs> so who you're dealing with matters a lot in terms of perception. Um, so we add this final bit to the secret sauce. First, we know who we are. And with that self-awareness, we have a chance of seeing other people clearly. But think about it for a second. If you haven't done the work to analyze your own influence style and your own negotiation style, how likely is it that you will see others and interpret others' behavior clearly. Pretty remote. Because basically, we interpret other people's conduct based on our own feelings of what's appropriate. And if I'm an avoider, I'm going to think that the appropriate thing is not to make a big, brutal issue out of something. And I'm going to ascribe to their behavior a motive which isn't true. I'm going to think that they don't like me or that they're that they're really angry or that they're, you know, they're, they're, they're acting out of some motive. And in fact, it's just a personality trait. It's just a way they have of managing uh, uh, themselves in, in, in human setting. And so that self-awareness gives you the chance to interpret behavior with clarity instead of fantasy. And that is such a valuable skill. Uh, and we even have some research. Well, I'll give you Henry, Henry Ford's quote and then the research. Ford, of course, he didn't follow his own advice here. Uh, if there's any secret to success, it lies in the ability to get the other person's point of view and to see things from that person's angle as well as your own. This from the guy who said, you can have any car you want as long as it's black. Uh, but I think as a management matter, he was pretty good at this uh, and was able to inspire a lot of people with a lot of differences to pull on the same rope and get uh, you know, a lot done. Historical studies that psychologists have done to study this trait of perspective taking ability, and they actually have gone back and read people's letters and speeches to see, to look for a, a, a psychological construct they call interpersonal cognitive complexity. That is, the ability to see things naturally from multiple points of view as they're expressing themselves. And here's what they found. Lenin had a lot of this perspective taking ability, and Trotsky had almost none. Now, Lenin built the Soviet Union, and Trotsky was shot in Mexico. Uh, uh, that tells you something. A lack of perspective-taking ability actually gives you the drive and the certainty to be a revolutionary, but not an institution builder. Same for Cuba. Castro profiles it with a lot of this perspective-taking ability. He's still down there. Still, uh, you know, imagine how hard it's been for him to stay in power with the whole weight of the United States over 50 years trying to get him out. And a whole group of people in, in Miami working pretty hard at it, too. Uh, che Guevara murdered in Bolivia. Uh, the revolutionary, the, the uh, institution builder. 
And then finally, in the American Civil War, the person with the highest degree of this protective capability was Robert E. Lee. He did the most with the least in terms of the Civil War, in terms of the, the, the management of an army. But the only one who had more than he, Ulysses Grant, the guy who beat him. Uh, and so this is actually a leadership trait as well. And since this is a leading at Google lecture as well, it's worth noting in passing. Your ability as a leader to see things from the point of view of the landscape you're in, of, of the people that are going to be marshaled against you in a particular area, or the people that you're trying to get to follow you, critical to your ability to communicate to them in the way that they will hear you and be inspired by you to uh, take action. Uh, uh, so a general can see the battlefield the way the other general is going to see it, get to the right place before they do, and that's why they win. Uh, so this perspective-taking ability, well worth working on. And finally, uh, you know, the more uh, you worry about this and work on it, the more success you'll have more of the time. But this is not a subject on which we look for radical transformation. Our hope and all our teaching at Wharton uh, in this area is to just make you a little bit better. <laughs> because this is a skill that's wired into your basic personality, your basic credibility, your basic approach to other people. And if you mess with that, you immediately start looking like a, a robot. Because it's false, you lose your sense of authenticity, and you start uh, lacking credibility. So we look for the 5% improvement. The little adjustments you can make based on insight, practice, that will make you a little bit better more often. And a little bit better in this area means a huge outcome difference. I was uh, doing a program at, in Copenhagen uh, last year for a shipping company, and I was teaching ship captains to be more persuasive and influential. P cargo ship captains. Anybody here ever met a guy who runs a tanker? Uh, they are, of all the people in the world, the most inclined to authority. <laughs> they, they just say, jump, and everybody jumps. And yet the company brought me in to teach them influence and persuasion. And I, I, during the dinner between the two days, I sat next to one of the captains and said, what am I doing here? What's going on? And they said, well, we're going to be port captains. They're going to put us in charge of Singapore and Hong Kong and New York. And in those roles, we can't rely on authority anymore. So they're trying to teach us how to, to be a little more persuasive. And I thought, that's interesting. He said, and then he said, and this is my concluding remark, he said, and I think I understand what you're trying to do with us. And I said, what's that? He said, well, if I leave Liverpool and I'm headed for North America and I make a 5% course mistake, where do I end up? And you know, you end up in Florida maybe. I mean, you're headed for New York, you end up someplace in Nova Scotia. Uh, he said, what you're trying to help us with is you want to give us a 5% course correction so that more often we're going to get where we want to go. And that's the goal of any good persuasion course, is to give you that 5% course correction so that more often you get where you're trying to go. So thank you for your attention. I appreciate it.